Now, major development over the past 24 hours, with university researchers having announced re results of the latest phase of their COVID-19 vaccine prototype. In South Africa, 60% efficacy for the prevention of mild, moderate and severe COVID-19 disease were observed in 94% of the participants who were HIV negative. Importantly, they observed significant clinical efficacy against both the rapidly emerging South African and UK mutant variants. For more on this development and I guess for context on how we should respond to it, let's bring in Professor of Vaccinology at Viz University, Professor Shabir Mahdi, who joins us now via our video link. Prof, thanks for your time and welcome to the program. Forgive me, this might come across as a rudimental question, but why are there different efficacy levels depending on where you are in the world? Is that largely dependent on the variants? Uh, good evening, Ayanda, and absolutely, you've answered the question. The South African and the UK variant are very, very different variants in that uh, although both of the variants same, share the same mutation, which enable, enables the virus to be more transmissible, the bigger concern with the South African variant uh, is that it's got additional mutations, which makes, it less, which makes the virus less sensitive to the antibody that's triggered either by vaccination uh, with a prototype uh, vaccine constructs, as well as uh, from past infection from viruses that were different from the variant that's currently circulating. So as you mentioned, the South African study was able to show 60% efficacy. And in fact, the efficacy readout is specific to the variant because more than 90% of all of the cases that were evaluated in the study was a consequence of infection from the variant that's uh, currently dominating in South Africa. So how do we respond to a context where both variants are in one population? And I'm only asking this because we've heard that uh, efficacy levels are closely tied to when a population actually gets to herd immunity. So hypothetically speaking, if this was the vaccine of choice, um, how do we determine how many people would need to be vaccinated with this vaccine if there are different efficacy yeah, so levels? Me... Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So firstly, just to, uh, just to correct something, yeah. uh, the study from South Africa only showed protection against the South African variant. There's another study in the UK, which showed 89% efficacy against the UK variant. Uh, but in terms of your question, unfortunately, what another major finding of the study, uh, which really comes as a shock, to be honest, uh, is that in the group that were randomized to receive the placebo, that is an inactive substance, uh, roughly about 30% of that group were already had already been infected with the previous virus that had been circulating in South Africa. And when we compared that placebo group between those that were what we call seropositive, that were previously infected with the earlier virus and the seronegative group, what we actually uh, showed was there was absolutely no difference in the infection rate with COVID-19 uh, during the period of time when this variant has been circulating. So what that basically unmasks is that unlike our thinking in the past that previous infections might protect you against reinfection, in this particular instance where there's been this tremendous mutation in the virus, it seems to be resistant in terms of being avoided in people that were previously infected with other variants. So that is another major finding. And this uh, really brings up a number of issues and also explains very much why we have experienced in South Africa a second wave uh, that far exceeds the first wave, both in terms of number of hospitalizations as well as the number of people that have died from COVID-19. The, the moving forward, uh, what we face with right now is we do have a vaccine that protects against the variant. Uh, and even though the protection might not be 90 or 95 percent, it is 60 percent. And we need to understand that it's not only the that point estimate that's important, a vaccine that is 90 percent efficacious, that is only available to 10 percent of the population, will achieve much less than a vaccine that is 60 percent efficacious and is received by 25% of the population. Mm. So there's a number of factors at play. Uh, but right now, what we know is that this is the only vaccine. And today, another vaccine was reported, the J&J &J vaccine. These are two vaccines which have now shown to be able to protect against uh, this particular variant and probably would have higher efficacy when it comes to severe disease caused by the variant. Right. Let's talk about availability then of the Novavax uh, uh, treatment. How quickly can this be rolled out if, of course, it goes through the necessary processes to be approved? 
But so there's another st study that's currently underway in the United States as well, which, and, which plans to enroll up to 30,000. And between the study in the United States and the United Kingdom, the company will then pursue to get a vaccine authorized by relevant re regulatory authorities. That is unlikely to occur in the space of at least two months from now. Uh, this is a small biotech company, but they are trying to scale up their manufacturing capacity. Uh, I don't think it's uh, very likely that we will see a substantial quantity of this vaccine become available at least until the second quarter, towards the latter part of the second quarter of 2021. Uh, so even though we've got evidence that this vaccine works, uh, it's still unfortunately going to be some time uh, before the vaccine becomes available on the market. Mm. What the company is working on in the meantime is to actually have what they call a bivalent vaccine, which includes a prototype uh, vaccine, but also adds to it a vaccine that is specific to the variant that's currently dominating in South Africa. Sure. We've heard that, you know, the, the, the variants we know now are not the only variants that could emerge because of just how COVID-19 works. In the event that there is a third independent variant that appears in a different part of the world, how is that going to complicate how this vaccine and any other is used to inoculate the population? Yeah. So it very much depends on the extent of the mutation that's taken place and which part of the virus has been affected. So if there's further mutations uh, to the specific mutations, if there are further mutations to the specific parts of the virus, which have been affected to the South African uh, mutations, uh, then we might be in for a stormy road ahead. Uh, and it's really difficult to predict. I don't think many people would have predicted the evolution of the variant that's currently circulating in South Africa, another variant that has now emerged in Brazil. Uh, which is also very similar to the South African variant in that it's going to be less sensitive to the effect of the first generation of COVID-19 vaccines. So the only way to keep up with this is to continue doing what South Africa has really been great at doing. And that is to have active surveillance, including sequencing, to be able to identify when these variants evolve. And then it's going to be up to companies to react, to make sure that the vaccines become more customized. When is this going to end? It's really difficult to tell. But right now, I think the most important thing is we do have a vaccine that is efficacious against the variant that is dominating in South Africa. Well, thanks very much for your time. Really important considerations to be made as we respond to these news. Professor Shabir Mahdi is a professor of vaccinology at Wits University. Prof, thanks very much indeed for your time.